Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. We're going to jump right in here and read this verse. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now, that's a verse that will help with your Bible study. We know that in the same chapter, in verse 15, uh, it's the only reference in the Bible that commands you to study uh, to rightly divide the word of truth. And it's verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, there's... That verse is packed full of information, but it's, we're commanded to study that it's work. You know, the workman involved to study is, it requires work, uh, but there's a way to study it so that when we're, our workmanship is reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ, we won't be ashamed. If we don't study rightly dividing the word of truth, if we just take the entire word of God, mix it all up, and pick verses out without paying attention to what program is being dispensed by God, we could end up following commandments of God for the nation of Israel in time past that don't have anything to do with God's the obedience that we need to be uh, serving the Lord in according to the program that God is dispensing today in this dispensation of grace. So God would have us do some things today that he didn't command Israel to do. And we, there are some things that he commanded Israel to do that don't have anything to do with our, God's purpose today in this age of grace. So if we want to be approved unto God, he's the one that we're seeking to please. Not our neighbors, not our parents, uh, not our uh, peers, not, not those of us that, that we're trying, we shouldn't be trying to please man. We should be, our goal should be to please God. And so as we've been studying dispensations as to the different programs that God revealed in the scriptures through different men over time, covenants that God's made in time past, namely with the nation of Israel, we're, we're considering uh, going through the law program. And, and this verse tells us, verse 7 again, consider what I say, Paul says, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now, if you want to understand God's purpose and programs in time past, it would help you to read what Paul has to say about those programs in time past. And with that, I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 3. Go to Galatians 3. And in, in the book of Galatians, Paul deals with the problem that the, nation, that, uh, the body of believers of the Galatian churches had with being put under Israel's law program. And so Paul's dealing with the Galatians and explains to them what the purpose of the Old Covenant was. And um, uh, we could jump in, there's, there, we could start in verse 8 and read all the way through the end of the chapter. Uh, but being that for time's sake, we're just going to, again, look at a couple verses here. Um, he says in verse 9, So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So the reference is to the father, Israel's father Abraham. You remember with Abraham, with the uh, Abrahamic covenant, God told Abraham that he would make of his seed a great nation and they would inherit the land forever. The land turns out to be Palestine, from Egypt all the way up to Syria uh, and uh, westward to the coast, all the way eastward uh, toward Babylon. So that whole land area was to be their inheritance forever. And that was an unconditional covenant. But then God added the law after he promised Abraham that Israel would have eternal life in the land forever. God entered into a covenant with, through Moses with the nation of Israel, the law. Now the law uh, was added 400 years basically after God made the covenant with Abraham. Now let's, let's drop down here. Uh, verse 10. <clears throat> For as many as are as of the works of the law are under what? They're under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So the law contains about 700 commandments and ordinances. If you don't do all the law, you're under God's curse. 
And what's the curse? The curse is condemnation because the law is the litmus test that indicates if you're a sinner or not. Now, all the law can do is condemn you for your sin according to what Paul says about that law. Now, a lot of people today are trying, as Christians, live under the law. So all they're doing is they're provoking their conscience to guilt and they're putting themselves under a performance system that constantly makes them, makes them feel out of touch with God because of their condemnation and guilt that the law brings. So Paul is telling these Galatians, you're foolish for putting yourself back under the law after God has made you righteous in Christ according to the gospel that you trusted. Now notice as he goes down in the chapter, he says, verse 11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. The law is not of faith. It's, the law is not trusting God to make you righteous in Christ. The law is you trying to perform righteousness, self-righteousness, in order to make yourself acceptable to God. It's you trying to bridge the gap between you and God by your performance. Right? Your, your human good side of your old sin nature is convincing you that religion is the way to heaven is what's happening there. You're not agreeing to, with God, what God said the purpose of the law was. Now, God tells us the purpose of the law here in the chapter uh, through the Apostle Paul. As he goes down, he says, uh, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Christ, on the cross, was nailed to the cross. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So Christ bore the wrath for our sins so that God could accept that as the payment for our sin and then accept us in his son, making us righteous in Christ, giving us his son's perfect righteousness. Now, how does that fulfill God's program with Israel? As well as we have benefit in this age of grace, we get in on the blessings of the new covenant. Um, in, by being put in Christ and receiving that eternal life directly by being put in Him. But verse 14 says that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now what's that talking about? Well, there's a righteousness through Christ that God, God the Holy Spirit makes us righteous in the Son, the second person of the Godhead. He puts us in Christ and then we're sealed there according to um, the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. So there's a spiritual righteousness that we're made righteous in Christ through the new covenant. And then there's a following under the law of Moses isn't a spiritual righteousness it's a practical sanctification it's you trying to walk in the righteousness of the law by your own willpower and by trying to do the exercises of the law so there's a spiritual righteousness promise of the spirit was something that was promised to Abraham that he would make Abraham and his seed righteous so they could live forever in the land Verse 15, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be a man's covenant, yet it, if it be confirmed, no man disethnoweth or addeth thereunto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this day, and this I say, that the covenant, which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore, then serveth the law. So God made a covenant with Abraham, an unconditional covenant. You're going to receive the land forever. You're going to have eternal life. Your seed, Abraham, is going to have eternal life in the land forever. But if the law made it possible for them to be in the land forever, then God isn't going to give eternal life to Israel through promise. It's going to be through 
performance. It's going to be through uh, works of Israel under the law, right? So God didn't say, Israel, you're going to be in the land forever, but this is how you're going to do it. If you keep the law, all 700 of them, without failing, you can inherit the land forever in, by your performance under the law. That's not what God told Israel. Notice verse 18. The inheritance, this is what God made with Abraham. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave to Abraham by promise. Wherefore serveth the law? So there's the question. Why did God give Israel the law after he told them, I'm going to make you able to live in this land forever, but then add the law? Why did God add the law? Well, through Paul, we're going to understand. Consider what Paul says, and the Lord give us understanding in all things, is what he said over there in Timothy. Wherefore serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come, to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now, that's just another way of saying the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, the second person of, of the Godhead, gave the law to Moses. But it was a covenant that God entered into with the nation of Israel. How can you be a mediator of a covenant if you are giving that covenant, if you're the one giving it? Well, God is one, but he can do it. Okay? So he made this covenant with Moses. Uh, now, verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? If he promised it to Israel through the Abrahamic covenant, is the law coming along and saying, Israel, you can't get it, even though I promised it to you unconditionally, and I'm God and I cannot lie. Even though I made that promise to your father Abraham, now the law says you can't get it. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. If there had been a law given, which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. If God could have made men righteous by giving them laws and commandments and, and telling them, if you do this, I can give you eternal life. If that was possible, to give man eternal life through God giving us a law, then Christ didn't need to go to the cross, did he? The Lord Jesus Christ didn't have to be made sin, uh, suffer the wrath of God as, uh, to suffer the payment for our sins if God could have made us righteous with giving us works to do to merit it on our own. So, look at the verse again. Verse 22. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. Now there, when you read, the Scripture hath included all under sin, hath concluded all under sin. That's a reference to the law. Okay? The law hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Christ came and he fulfilled the law. What the law did was it was an indicator that's the Messiah. The Lord Jesus Christ was three years with Israel just like the Passover lamb was, was to be watched for three days before they... Uh, slaughtered the lamb, put, its, put the lamb's blood on their door frame so that the death angel would pass over that household because of the innocent lamb that was slain. They were to watch that lamb and make sure that lamb was perfect, that it wasn't diseased, that it wasn't, there wasn't something wrong with the lamb because then it wouldn't do for a savior. Christ, three years, was before Israel and no one could convince him of sin. Nobody could prove that he was a sinner. The Pharisees tried to condemn him for being sinful, but he claimed himself to be the Son of God, Israel's Messiah, and he never sinned, and then they crucified him. So the law, he fulfilled the law, and then as a perfect Savior, was a perfect sacrifice to die to pay for the sins of all men. So verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which afterwards sh should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith is come we are no longer under a schoolmaster. 
For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you're in Christ, is Christ Abraham's seed? Yes. And if you're in him and God accepts you in Christ, he's accepting you in one who is the seed that Abraham was told would come, that would fulfill the law and make it possible for Israel to dwell in the land forever. So Christ wasn't a desperate option that God came up with when he saw that Israel wasn't going to make it under the law program. He had to come up with something to be able to save Israel as he promised Abraham he would and let them live in the land forever. So he came up with the idea, okay, then I'll send my son and, and crucify him and he'll pay the debt that Israel under the law owed. He wasn't a plan B. He was plan A. God had the cross in mind when he gave Israel the covenant under Abraham that they would, in, hit through Abraham's seed, through his physical seed line, would come a Savior. And through that Savior, Israel could live in the land forever, have eternal life, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah, that would be shed for them at Calvary. Did Israel understand this and know this? Did they know that God would, Christ would come, die on the cross, and pay for their sins back there after Abraham? And the answer is no. They didn't understand how God was going to give them the land forever and make them live forever in the land. But they were taught to trust God to, when God made a promise with them, they could believe it. And they were to have faith in God for eternal life to save them. And the law was a schoolmaster to teach them that you're sinful, each individual. They can't stand before God on the basis of their performance of the law because they couldn't do it. So that's what, uh, uh, and if you look at chapter 4 of Galatians, same point Paul's making uh, about Israel being under the law until he entered into the new covenant with Israel. And that'll happen at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he returns, he's going to save Israel from their enemies. And he's going to give them resurrection life in the kingdom. And in that resurrection body that they're going to be given by God, they're going to be born again as a nation. And they're going to be able to live before God perfectly as that perfect, righteous nation of priests. And they're going to be the priestly nation through which God rules over the earth in that kingdom. Now, we're not going to be here during that program. We're going, to be, we're going to be raptured out of here before that time of great tribulation begins, before the second coming of the Lord. And he will come and fulfill Israel's program, but right now he's interrupted Israel's program for almost 2,000 years. And now he's doing something else. And you read Romans through Philemon and you learn about what God's doing with the church, the body of Christ. But his purpose in time past... Um, in Galatians 4, he says, Now I say then that an heir, as long as he is a child, dif differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. That's Israel under the law. The law was their tutor and governor. What does a tutor do? Tells you what to do. What does a law, what does a governor do? Tells you what you can't do. And that was the purpose of the law. Now, going back uh, to Exodus, we've been spending some time in Exodus, a little bit of time looking at this law program. God, in chapter 19 of Exodus, we've been looking at when God gave the law the first time to Israel, He gave them the law the second time through Moses in Deuteronomy. But this is the first giving of the law. Israel is delivered from the Egyptians, comes out of their bondage uh, to, the, uh, to Egypt under Pharaoh. And then God appears to Israel from the mountain, Mount Sinai, and gives them the law. <clears throat> now, what we've been paying attention to here is that when God told Moses that he was going to give them the law, God would, was going to 
call Moses up on the mountain and give the law to the nation of Israel. He was preparing Israel and he tells Moses to keep Israel set bounds around the mountain because the mountain remember was thundering and lightning and it was smoke and God's presence came down from the third heaven and he met with Moses on the top of the mountain. I want you to notice with me this morning look at verse um, 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and will keep my covenant, the law of Moses, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came, called for the elders of the people, laid before and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And notice the response of the elders. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the Lord of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day, for, yeah, for the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And notice verse 12, And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall be stoned or shot through. Whether it shall be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And I want you to look down at, at um, <clears throat> verse 17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount at the bottom. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount shaked, or quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon the Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to the mount, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds ab uh, ab about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto Moses, or said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. And Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. Now, the reason we're reading this again, because we read this recently, because I want us to understand the picture of what God is doing with Israel with the law. The law was given to cause Israel to fear God and realize that they were sinful and that God and His holiness and His justice as who He is, as a righteous and holy God, cannot accept sin or tolerate sin and sin must be punished. Now, the only way to approach God then is to fear Him and respect Him. Okay? So God, as a picture, we've seen over in Exodus 34, uh, if you want to go back to 34, Moses says, show me your glory, Lord. 
And the Lord comes down in Exodus chapter 34, uh, verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Now, do you get that picture with the Mount Sinai on a smoke, the quakes, telling, warning Moses, if those people come out, I'm going to break forth on them and I'm going to kill them. Is that a picture of God's love and grace? Mercy and grace. Look, look at the verse again. Who are you, Lord? He said, the Lord passed by before him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, notice, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will, be, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. So who does God say he is to Moses? He's a God of grace and mercy, a God of love, a God of long-suffering, a God of goodness and truth. But he won't allow iniquity to go unpunished. Now, if you think about it, that's why Christ went to the cross. That was the whole point. And Christ, who is the creator, who is, I believe, the one coming into this covenant with Moses here on the mount, the law, he's trying to teach Israel to fear him. Go to Proverbs uh, chapter 1. Why do you need a savior? Why do you trust Christ died for your sins? Why is that important? Because you're a sinner and God can't let your sin go unpunished. And if you don't trust in Christ as your Savior, if you don't go to God to fix your sin problem, and you try to ex get God to accept you on the basis of your religious goodness and performance, huh? you trying to live righteous enough to get God's blessing, you'll end up paying for your own sins in hell for eternity. You need to appreciate you're a sinner. God cannot accept you. You touch that mountain, you're going to get fried in an instant because God can't tolerate your sin on the mountain in his presence. It's Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's man's problem. Man's got a pride problem. And man doesn't want to just accept what God has to say about his sinful condition. Man's old nature will never trust in God or believe in him. Our old sin nature is a rebel. It hates God and will never be a friend of God. Thank God we have a three-part nature. We also have a soul and a spirit. And our soul listens to what our old nature says. And our soul can also listen to the Word of God. And that's where we have the free will to make a decision. We're going to trust God and what He says about our sin. And that God can't accept our sin for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Are we going to believe God about that? Or are we going to trust in what man's wisdom says? Oh, they're written to God. That's all, that Bible, that's all old-fashioned uh, wisdom that was written. That's words of men. It's not the word of God. And they'll try to explain away God so that they can enjoy their sin. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So why is it that God gave the law? The law was given in order to show Israel that he wanted to walk with them as a friend, but Israel would not walk with him as a friend until they feared him. Because Israel's a type of us. We have a sin nature, Israel had a sin nature. Everything Israel does, we would do if we were in their position. Israel in the wilderness, God had led them from ten plagues out of Egypt, but when they got thirsty, what did they think? They're all going to die. God didn't have any, any way to deal with this problem of not having water because they weren't in Egypt where the Nile River was. They were going to die. God opened the rock. He, he took the, the, uh, the water that was, they couldn't drink, wormwood, and he made it possible for them to drink. He made the bitter water clean. They were hungry. They were, oh, now God solved our water problem, but now we're going to die of starvation. They didn't trust God. They murmured. God gave them, he gave them the bread from heaven, right? Manna. They got tired of that. They got sick of that manna. Now they're cursing God, murmuring against God, and he gave them quail. 
right? Gave them so much quail, he gave them quail, but, but the idea here is everything you need Israel, I can provide you. But Israel would not trust God, and so what they were was a bunch of murmurs, they wanted to go back to Egypt, even though God had taken care of them. So the point is, Israel was acting like a bunch of spoiled brats, just like we would have. They weren't happy with the way God was dealing with them, and they were complaining, just like we, we do. We're not happy with our circumstances. We complain, we get depressed, we get down. But we don't think about all that God accomplished through the cross for us. We need to realize God took care of all of our need through the cross. But now we can walk by faith in who and what God's made us. And we can suffer, but rejoice in his provision that he made for us at Calvary while we suffer. Why was the law given? To teach Israel as a child. If you raise a child and you don't make them live under fear of you, the parent, to maybe it's whatever discipline you, you think that is appropriate for that child's heir, but if you don't teach that child to fear the discipline that will come if they don't behave, what will happen? What does the Bible say that child's going to, how it's going to develop? A child's going to pitch a fit, complain, demand its way, cry, lay on the floor, kick, have a tantrum, because that child doesn't believe that you're going to respond to their tantrum, to their demands that get their way. That child doesn't believe they have to behave. Israel was this, what the law did for Israel was it showed Israel they were that child, that spooled, rotten child, but they needed to fear God and respect Him. Respect is basic to all relationships, isn't it? Love and respect. Now, let's close. We're way over time, but let's close. Go to Exodus chapter 19. And we'll close. Go, I'm sorry, chapter 20. I, wanna, I want you to see this one more time. We looked at it before. I want you to see this again. Chapter 20. He says in verse 4, verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's a jealous God. He wants our love. He wants our respect. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath or under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, and the jealous God, notice, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that, what? Hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that, what? Love me and keep my commandments. A child that loves their parents, are they going to want to behave out of the right motivation? Because they want to please mom and dad? Okay, that's a child that respects their parents and loves their parents. Okay, under tutors and governors until God can have a relationship with them as adult children, Israel, under the new covenant. God deals with us, thankfully, in this age of grace as an adult deals with his adult children. That's how God deals with us today. He's made us righteous in Christ and now we have the choice to serve him and as a response to his grace and our motivation isn't fear and guilt as the law motivates to serve him but our motivation is love and gratitude so what God knew about Israel is they would fail under that system of fear and guilt did they fail? yeah they, God punished them with their enemies, did all the things that he told Moses that he would do to that nation. It was revealed up front, if you break my covenant, I'm going to destroy you as a nation. Did he destroy them as a nation? Yeah. They became a great nation under David and Solomon, but what happened at the end of the book of Kings and Chronicles? They were carried away into captivity by their enemies. God just about wiped them out, but he left a seed. He left a remnant. So, God dealt with Israel in his severity, but that wasn't enough to stop Israel's sin problem. So, what does, how does God want to deal with us? Like we saw there in, in Exodus chapter 34, God wants us to see his mercy and love. 
you see the Lord over in Revelation and other places in the Bible and his eyes are like fire he's brass he's on the blaze God is white with 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 indignation and wrath but then you also see him Matthew Mark Luke and John you see him in the book of Revelation as the lamb God walked with Moses how do you walk with somebody he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden they didn't walk behind God with their head down in submission like a servant they walked with God God wants you to walk with him as an adult child but before you can do that you have to appreciate that he's a God to fear and reverence in a marriage you can't have a love God's an unconditional love in your marriage unless there's respect on both sides a couple has to respect one another value and esteem one another that can't be a one-way street, can it? So without respect in all relationships, employee, employers, all relationships, friends, if you don't respect and value that person, you don't love them. So there is a basic lesson that God knew we needed and he tried to teach it to Israel with the law and that is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Until you see how lucky you are that God's mercy and grace have not come down and wiped you out because you're a sinner because of Calvary because of what Christ did on the cross God has accepted you in his son and given you the promise of eternal life with him you got to appreciate that to love God and want to serve him out of love and gratitude